Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here, back with a new commentary, and today my good friend Tim Partridge is joining me. How are you doing, Tim? I'm great, thank you, Oliver. How are you? I'm very well. Um, so, Tim, what are we discussing today? Today, Oliver, we're discussing Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and for this, we'll be sp- obviously, we'll, there'll be spoilers involving the film, and also spoilers involving the source material that it's based on, which is the book Who Censored Roger Rabbit by Gary Kay. Wolf. Here we go. Well, okay, folks, now if you wish to sync the commentary with your own copy of the film, put the timestamp to zero and press play now. Touchstone Pictures, owned by Disney, which probably obviously helped in getting them a lot of the characters from Disney World. Obviously, with Spielberg attached, it's, he's probably the only one to have the power to bring, to bring Warner Brothers and Disney cartoons into one film, which will never happen again, I don't think. I don't think it has. And they actually said in the commentary as well that um, they didn't know whether it was going to be Disney or Touchstone until right at the end of that's the film. That's right, yeah. yeah, that's bizarre, isn't it? And obviously they said that everyone gets saying to them during the, the, the promos, Where's it, why is there no question mark for, the, for yeah, who framed yeah, Roger yeah. Rabbit? Um, this is stunning, isn't it, this opening, this God. sequence by Richard Williams. I mean, we grew up, I think as well, just to give a bit of context, when we grew up in the sort of late 80s into the 90s, they would show a lot of classic Warner Brothers, Tex Avery, MGM uh, cartoons. They'd show them in breaks between sort of sport events and things, or if the news or whatever, if, if there was just like a five-minute spot running, they'd stick a Looney Tunes cartoon or, or whatever in. And um, so we kind of grew up on this stuff. And, and it was also at that point in the 80s where we've mentioned this kind of before to ourselves, yeah. but um, there was a lot of uh, kind of filmation and all these kind of companies that were making... At cartoons that were there to create toys, sell toys to kids, and they had sort of very limited animation in them. And there was, uh, uh, there was this amazing renaissance that was happening at that time. And all, all this kind of um, the classic Warner cartoons and stuff that we saw on TV that always looked like they were higher grade. It, it oh, was yeah. starting to come back in. Mm. Um, and I guess we, there was a build up with like an American Tale and Don Bluth and... Yeah, that's true. I mean, because Disney had kind of lost its way in the mid-80s with like Black yeah. Cauldron and things like that. But this was, obviously the artists doing this had done tons of commercials, hasn't it? Well, it's Richard Williams for yeah. a start, who would animate at 24 frames a second. Um, he'd done, I mean, he, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of Richard Williams. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit of an animation geek in, in general. <laughs> um, but uh, he did title sequences for films like um, the, uh, the Pink Panther Strikes Again, that's right. um, Return of the Pink Panther. He did um, a really amazing one, and not a cartoony one either, for um, a film called One. Uh, if anything happened on the way to the forum. Oh it's yeah, absolutely brilliant. But this stuff is amazing because they've taken. Um, well, they they kind of said they've taken characters that look like they're kind of Warner Brothers characters, which I think kind of post-date the era that this mm. is set in because they're more sort of Chuck Jonesy kind of. But then they've got this Tex Avery thing with the with the eyes oh, popping out yeah. and stuff, and also the Disney sort of uh, realistic and movement. Yeah, yeah, it? and the heart. Yeah. really the heart of the Disney and, and there was a lot of that that was happening kind of at that time but this stuff is just I remember as a kid just seeing this for the first time and seeing the adverts and everything and just absolutely my mind being blown away and we've just talked over some key stuff I mean now we're just seeing the pots and pans falling down but there's a heck of a lot of violence in this <laughs> um, and I remember not lo- long after you had stuff like Itchy and Scratchy in The Simpsons yeah, where they were yeah. making fun of this yeah. but I remember just seeing on the trading cards and stuff of this like Baby Herman going across the knives here and the, earlier going across the um, the, uh, the kitchen but going off the worktop and going on to the cooker mm. area and stuff and and it's all this kind of like ramped up cartoon Tom and Jerry violence yeah. but dialed up so much and then there's all this amazing dimensional uh, animation which well when he just... kind of goes flying around the room it's just like the the, the camera movements within that yeah. sort of animation is incredible you know this bit here with the air goes near his bum he's like I thought it was wonderful the uh, but it is it's, it's seeing what these cartoons we grew up watching and by that point they would they yeah. had been produced years ago uh, yeah. but done on a huge scale with huge money um and just, i don't know to you i don't know what it's like to you but to me those cartoons those kind of classic disney and warner brothers and texture mm. shorts i always saw them as like the gold standard yes in fact actually as a brit because mm. we didn't really have an industry like that you know i, no. I always sort of when i sort of think like the snowman i thought why can't it look like these american <laughs> yeah, classic yeah, things yeah. and this this shot here is absolutely 
phenomenal when they open the door and we mentioned we've we've got joel silver playing the director there but what's so absolutely amazing is this is all in one shot all the way to the reveal shot Mm. of uh, bob hoskins and um it's just mind-blowing i remember the first time maybe it's the resolution in vhs as well but when they open the door i thought i was still watching the cartoon Mm. and then when you see the human walk in your mind sort of gets blown because you'd seen this at the cinema hadn't you i hadn't actually i I saw it on vhs but i saw everything i was obsessed with it and saw everything i don't know why i didn't see the cinema bizarre um but just like they had a i think shreddies the the serial um mm. at the time they had a was it a mystery tour thing that you could win oh, for whom right. came roger rabbit and i'd eat shreddies and i'd see that every day and so eventually <laughs> I, I i demanded i get the vhs when it came out i mean look at this look at the interaction look at all the details look at the set look at well, there's all always got the issues as a wires haven't they to sort of pull things um had sort of obviously the sets move in yeah. a particular way for none of them for removed something and this great reveal shot here i mean what's so great is you've got eddie valiant who is i mean he's 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 been through so much trauma but you see immediately his disdain for the tunes yes and you set up the alcoholism as well yeah straight away his drinking problem and um he's very different to how he is in the book as well yeah because i'd I'd never read the book and uh, tim had sort of in preparation for doing his commentary had sort of made an effort to sort of read the book and he he, i said to him you know what, what did you what did you think of it then and he was just like oh it's a bit weird (laughs) <laughs> so yeah well because so, they changed so much didn't they? yeah it's virtually unrecognizable in many ways although there's some thematic stuff that still stays mm. there i and mean a, it's a couple of lines of dialogue yeah yeah, yeah. i was yeah. just going to say this actor here is alan tilver and he's a british actor um and here he's doing a very convincing american accent but it's sort of in the lead up to this you'll see him in films like superman he's the guy saying army bird heading south <laughs> and and in, in in little shop of horrors i think he gets one line where during downtown he says yes you go and that's it you know <laughs> and for he, and but he'd done many films in the 50s as well and, and 60s and he he was a yeah he was a great great actor and um, well zemeckis said you know they hired a lot of local talent who could do very good american accents yeah and always they sort of reused them you know for, for these kind of big blockbusters absolutely and i want to say bob hoskins He's one of the finest screen actors we've ever had. Yeah, ever. Incredible, yeah. Ever. I mean, because the Americans didn't really know of him that that well in terms of, like, you know, sort of the mainstream audience because he'd done Mona Lisa and Long, Long Good Friday, uh, sort of adult movies. And this is yeah. kind of a kid's family-friendly kind of film. And opened him up to this kind of, you know, uh, to the American and worldwide audience. And then he obviously got thrown to Super Mario Brothers and stuff. But yeah. um, it's sad he uh, passed away a number of years ago because he just... Uh, one of those actors who was a great character actor really. yeah yeah i was going to say mention about the moviol the uh steenbeck the uh, edit yes. machine that gets taken away which is mm. set up for later there's so much stuff in this film that's so clever mm. where they set stuff up for later and actually in the book at the beginning you don't get you don't get to see you know this um this period beautifully period recreated yeah, um, Cause cartoon the, cause sequence. You said the book was set in sort of modern time when it was written yes. in the early 80s. It, set, it was released in 1981, mm. uh, but it's about comic books. And at the beginning of this, um, you have Eddie Valiant, who isn't really set up as anything. Um, he he just sort of, he's already talking, he's making a deal with Roger. He's not making a deal with Arkane Maroon. There isn't an Arkane Maroon in the book. It's actually these brothers called the Degreesies who, right. who run a comic book uh, thing. And um, and anyway, it, it, it all involves sort of comic strips and stuff, and it's 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 yeah, it's it's completely tonally different. And at some point, they must have um, moved everything to the 1940s once they'd bought the property. Once Disney yeah, had acquired, because, had optioned the, the film. Because Zemeckis wasn't he was, it, it, they wanted him to do it very early on in the 80s. And and the, if you go online, there's a sort of a little um, like a featurette about yeah. Roger Rabbit from 1983 where they had at that yeah. point changed the setting to be in the 40s. And it was Daryl Van Critter who was who'd done the animation who did a a really good short called um sport goofy at soccer mania it's really really good check oh, that yes. out yes I've seen um it, yeah. yeah yeah and anyway he was the animation director at that time and i think zemeckis may have been developing it too mm. i'm not quite sure of the intricacies of uh, you know of that but if you go on uh, a youtube channel called the, the thief archive mm. Um, and, and that's all got Richard Williams stuff in. That's got a lot of that stuff all the in commercials it. and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's also got that stuff that you just referred to as mm. well. Yeah. This is, oh, look at that. The other great thing about this film, right? I'm a, so, I love visual storytelling. And this film is just, it, if you're an aspiring young filmmaker watching this and you want to do long form, st- just study this film. It's so <laughs> good. It's perfect. I mean, even if you didn't have cartoon characters in it, 
it would be something else. You know, it just every the camera is always in the right place. The rhythm is incredible. It's not stuff that's done that's just shot and then edited with stuff changed later. It's there's no sort there's, of random like odd insert shots no. at all because it's all had to be locked off. It's choreographed. Done. Yeah, a year thing. before the animation was yeah. even had been applied to it. Um, so, which is difficult for Zemeckis because if, if the studio were like, you know, we want to make changes, well, you can't because yeah, um, yeah. it's all done. You know, you can't change any of the sort of the final edit. It's amazing. Hoskins is just incredible here. Isn't it's a he, quick too? shot of Bugs Bunny there. He doesn't yeah. really pop up till later. It sort of just seems a bit of a slight. Oh look, in the background, uh, uh, Max Fleischer. Is it the Max clown. Fleischer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now here we've got Eddie holding up the check and one thing that's interesting with the film is that he has this arc where he goes from very serious to at the end he gets his funny side mm. but he actually gets his funny side back because he was a joker to begin with mm. like when you see later on in the film you know we'll kind of go through it but um you know he's he and I think you can see little bits of that here and there like people don't quite take him seriously like yeah. when he's got the check he's what take he's not he's not you know, he's a very straight man, but everyone else who's a human kind of thinks he's a bit of an oddball. Um, and yeah, he, and he because he worked, with, that. He worked yeah. with tunes, that was it, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but he's completely sort of pressed that now. And mm. uh, there's this great, um, in terms of the plot and stuff, um, too, I mean, they just mentioned, too, you've got the, the kids on the back here of the um, the red car. Mm -hmm. There's this, what what the, this, the screenwriters have said is it's sort of based on um, a real thing that happened where there was the red car, uh, tra transit system um, mm. in Los Angeles and apparently there was a conspiracy to buy them out by car and tyre companies um, so that they could build freeways and, and, and stuff and people you know, buying cars and whatever and um, and anyway I looked at some I did some reading there's a there's a really good article on the LA LA.curbed and um, scpr.org as well and they they've kind of interviewed historians and stuff about what actually happened and apparently it was a lot more kind of nuanced than that apparently mm. the red car wasn't really making a profit for a long time and it just kind of put out regardless it was apparently this this legend um this kind of you know um, myth wasn't it yeah, yeah 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 that had kind of been, so i like that they took that from me they taken that from reality yeah um i mean it's that's absolutely brilliant and it adds an extra dimension and it and it helps the kind of noir setting i wouldn't <laughs> you know that, that it really feeds into it because this all this stuff was sort of interior stuff at LG Studios, which were yes, sort of had a crossover with Superman Four. But outside, it's all kind of like second unit, like stuff in Hollywood, isn't it? Yeah, uh, most of the exterior stuff you see, um, and this oh, this introduction here, brilliant for um, Joanna Cassidy as Dolores. She's just so good in this film. Oh, she's Blade Runner, a wonderful job in that. But we we spoke earlier too, just about how strong a character she is in this film as well. Mm, when she towers over him as well. They cast a lady who's far taller than Bob yeah, Hoskins. Yeah, yeah. And there's a real like, I guess because it's 1947 as well, but I remember like the time when we were growing up. You remember kind of in the late 80s, you'd meet kind of older people who'd actually been in the war. Mm. And this was a post-war film and you get like a real sense of people, not just people in from now wearing costumes from the period yeah but you actually get this kind of feeling that 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 of of just like this post-war sense of people who've lived through the war yeah yeah they're yeah. really tough and hardened and mm. you know and, and i think that really it really really comes across and she really gives that i think brilliantly and especially when you've got jessica rabbit as a contrast who is incredibly yeah. objectified cartoon of a woman <laughs> um you know actually it's interesting her intro jessica's intro in the book is is a lot different um and she's kind of cool there's loads of different stuff Cause in, in the book yeah she's left Roger to be in a film, yeah. isn't she? Yeah. Well, Roger's awful. Roger is an awful person in the book. He's actually, again, like we, we said spoilers, Roger is the villain in the book. Mm. You know, he turns out to be the, 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 the bad, to, to some degree, it's kind of, it's kind of mixed up. I, this sequence here with Angelo is so good <laughs> because you, you're just pushing all of his buttons and the way it's shot as well, like, I mean, there's so much um, credit that's given to, uh, rightfully, to Hoskins for interacting with it, with these uh, cartoon characters. He does a really good job with the sort of eye level and, um, and yeah, I say blocking the shots and getting them to move in a specific way. Because he, 
what I read years ago was that he had studied mime, so he really knew how to sort of interact with essentially nothing yeah. there. But with the human um, characters, he's amazing too. I mean, there, oh, yeah. you really get the sense of someone who's got something inside. And then, of course, she now mentions about his brother, and you see a little bit of that kind of rage coming through. I mean, the timing of that. I mean, it's such a darkly humorous joke, isn't it? Dropped well, she's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. She delivers it so seriously, up. doesn't she? That's, that's, that's what makes it work. With all the people lined well, this up. This is a bit thing, isn't it? They, said, they had said, like, I think Frank Marshall had said they, there was a bit of a hoo ha about um, having a cartoon character swear. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'm a wise ass. Um, and of course, we're coming to um, the Ink and Paint Club now. And um, sort of, even though this is a film about a guy who gets his sense of humour back and, mm. you know, and it's got cartoons and stuff in it, I mean, it's been said many times before that it's really a film about segregation. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Because the, the, the cartoon characters are all second, you know, second class citizens. You know, they're sort of. Uh, sort of they live in a separate town, they're yeah. separated by a wall yeah. that gets broken down at the end, you know. And, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. and, and anyway, those elements are in the book, like it, but it's not, it's not so much segregation. It's more like it, you've got like a neighbor you've got like there's a bit where Eddie Valiant kind of says um in, in, in you know in the book uh, the neighborhood's gone to hell now because I'm living next door to, to, to you know to, to cartoon characters um so that element was 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 there but I mean they bring it out here and people have compared this to kind of the cotton club as well although the time period's different because this is 1947 well because you you had said to me that the, the film had done I suppose at the time because of due segregation and sort of dealing with how people sort of civil, rights. Into, civil rights as the writers say in the commentary civil rights yeah it's like because you had Mississippi burning yeah, uh, around the time um, a world apart as well, well. Yeah. and a couple of years I think the year two before Alien Nation you'd mentioned well Alien Nation was the same year as this oh, and that kind of okay. covers the same thing you know and okay. it was also 1988 it was the 70th birthday of Nelson Mandela he had you know, mm. the concert um, you know South Africa there was still apartheid and there was still a lot of you know bad, bad feelings about that yeah. um, so like um, you I know mean, it's, it's, there's uh, something in the air you know oh yeah and that's why I'm not saying you know this is it, it's it, on the nose about it or no, like, no, trying no. to make a political statement and I don't think in a way in a sort of pushy way but it's, it's there it's obvious there it's obviously it's there rel- every film yeah. made in any era is made for an audience and you can see I mean you can read into Marvel films so it's subtext that's what it is <laughs> yeah here we go yeah we nailed it down to subtext you know um, um, but that this scene anyway is just absolutely incredible Stubby K he was um, he was an American uh, performer mm. who came to Britain. I think he's married to a, a, a British. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he, at that point, I think it was the same year that this came out. There was a Doctor Who. I'm not very good with Doctor Who, so I'm sorry if I've offended any Doctor Who fans. <laughs> but um, there's an episode with a circus tent that right. was kind of. Yeah, was, I, that, was this when they brought back Doctor Who in the eighties? No, no, yeah, the, 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 the Sebastian McCoy. Oh, Sebastian McCoy ones. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. He's in that, so he must have been shooting that at this time. I think that's the. They shot it, Elsie, didn't they? No, uh, they made some made some use of it, didn't they? No, but it was actually weirdly enough, it, it would have been probably White City. Which is near where they shot the ending of this film. Oh, right, so, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, this sequence here with it's Daffy. just bonkers because it, you know, to because an interesting point pointed out by I think it was Gene Siskel. He said he said to Roger Ebert, "Do you think this is made for kids or for adults?" And they both agreed it was made for adults because for an adult who grew up with Daffy Duck and Donald Duck, seeing them together on screen for the first time, because kids would kind of be probably be unaware of their sort of. Oh, there's a crossover. Okay, it's fine. But to an adult, that's like that's bonkers seeing that. You know, um, it would be like today having, you know, Captain America and Batman in a movie or something. People would be like, what? Just, that doesn't work. Yeah, the you way know? that they kind of got the licenses to have yeah. these different characters. Oh, Betty Boo, who should I mean that you used to see Betty, Betty Boo cartoons on on TV. As she, well. Sorry, did I say I said earlier Max Flash? It's Richard Flash, isn't it? Uh, Richard Fleisch is the director. Max Fleisch is the animator. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Um, but she was Betty Boot part of the Fleisch stuff. I yes, remember. I think so. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Popeye and things like that. I think wasn't it? Yeah. This is great. This is the the, the bit that really impressed me in terms of combining this animation with live action is when mm. she passes the camera and she's backlit. Yeah. By yeah. the stage lighting, it's just like ah, it's just. I was Mind say, bending. There's a bit before where Donald, where, where Daffy 
fires the well the cannons fire yeah, across the stage the, yeah. yeah and you see that reaction on um, on Eddie Valiant's face yeah and um, I, there's little bits that are planted in the film that kind of give that show you his sensitivity towards the violence of mm. tombs because he's been affected by his brother uh, it's, this is this film is perfect. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Because this is the, the singer here is uh, Spielberg's wife, Amy Irving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then it possibly becomes Kathleen. Yeah. Uh, Turner. For the speaking. Parts, yeah, the yeah. Sort of husky voice. Also, because she'd worked with him, Zemeckis on Romancing the Stone. Hadn't she? This is just stunning. Do you animation. think that with the, with the camera movements and the animation like there, where you've got this kind of it's difficult for the 2D animation just to fit within their sort of uh, the environment when the camera moves. Well, they did, Ken Ralston mentions at some point, I think it might, it might be this shot here, actually, they mm. use motion control. Yes, because they said there's, they had two sort of VistaVision cameras. So, yeah, Vista the whole Vision. film was shot on VistaVision. I thought, I, I thought it was only funny animation kicked in. Oh, okay. That's what I thought, yeah, uh, because the mix. So every time they did a... 2D bit of animation, yeah, Vista Vision. I think there were prototype cameras where they had... Um, but it's for the whole... I mean, for the whole hmm. film, you've got animation pretty yeah, much. Yeah, pretty much, to yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me it is all Vista Vision, but I'm sure it was a mix of 35 and Vista Vision. Well, also, Dean Cundy was a cinematographer, mm. and even though the film had begun in the States, like developed there, it came over. It was very rare at that time to have kind of an American cinematographer in England, and I'm guessing, you know... He, he, Union rules, yeah. If he was an expert of Vista Vision, mm. um, and also the camera operator on this was Raymond Stella, who operated the Steadicam on Halloween. Oh wow! As well, yeah. Look at this. Look at that, Hoskins that, here. He's that, amazing. It's always kind of it surprised me that the his, uh, that's, his performance. Um, so Mekas didn't work with Dean Cundy, you know, into the nineties and stuff. Well, he ended up working with Don Burgess, and they did some yeah. amazing work together. And Spielberg, didn't he? For but Jurassic look at Park. look at look at look at look at Hoskins here. He's just so good. I mean, he's as, he's as amazing in the animation. The reason the film works, and I should have said this earlier, I wanted to say this earlier, but I just, there's too much, there's just, forgive me, there's just too much great stuff. To do. The reason the film works is because you have that conflict. It's because mm. this film would just, when you see a lot of these films where it's, it's live action and it's animation and it's always kind of a gimmick and you, you they, they and you have a lot of the human characters kind of play up to try and play up to the animation and it becomes a bit kind of, the reason this Overacting, works. Yeah, sort of yeah, 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 yeah but they're playing to the tone and stuff. And the reason that this works is because this guy is dead serious and mm. he's deadpan and he's got, probably got PTSD, you know, <laughs> um, and, and he's, he, you know, he's, he's bereaved. He's heavily bereaved. He's lost his, his beloved brother, you know, mm. uh, and he's, cha it's just changed his whole outlook on everything. Yeah. Um, and he, he doesn't want to have, he, he doesn't want to entertain anything, any idea of being goofy or silly. No. Um, and he, uh, he sort of, becomes slightly goofy near the end to sort of yeah the the weasels well he has his art well he ends up kissing roger at the end oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. after he says don't kiss me you know <laughs> um and i mean this is so funny isn't it the innuendo the patter cake yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great absolutely great because this is all this is all elstree as well isn't it i presume yeah it must be stuff, i think yeah i'd be surprised if not i mean it's it's so funny because it's one of those it's kind of like acknowledging that whole thing you know when people say oh there's a, we've got a cartoon and kids can watch it mm. but there's stuff in there for adults yeah 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 i mean it, i think this is an adult film that appeals to kids yeah i think um because as a as a child i watched it i was really like wowed by it but i never felt myself really going back to it that much and as an adult i've actually started appreciating mm. appreciating it more because i was more in, in instead of being wowed by all these sort of characters who you've grown up seeing on tv you're actually more for me, I'm more invested in Bob Hoskins' character and this world. Yeah, he, he, he lives in this. I love the sort of film noir stuff to it because, as an adult, I sort of you know love seeing movies set in that sort of period. And you know what? In the in the book as well, there's so much dialogue and people walking into rooms and talking mm. and interrogation. It's basically Eddie Valiant interrogating everyone, mm. and you learn nothing about. There's nothing about his brother in there. Nothing. I mean, that doesn't exist. Oh he's, right. He's just a shell of a character who's got this. Um, you know he he's he's got a little bit of a drinking problem in there, but there, he's and he's not a particularly nice person. Mm. Um, and um, so, I mean, there's a moment coming up here. Sorry, when when he's he's flicking through and and you see Roger, sort of like just like freaking out 
on the table. And it's the only time actually in the film where I thought where the animation for Roger kind of dipped a bit. Like you, the, I was thinking that earlier actually because it goes it's, it's, it's gone back to to uh, twelve frames per second. It is. Oh, I think right. that's what it is. I was thinking that it, it looks like, like it's on it's like, twos. It's like you know exhaling. You know they um, call that they call that twos, don't they? That's right. Yeah. Um, any animators listening? If I got that wrong, correct me. <laughs> but um, I'm friends with a lot of animators, and they say they kind of look disdainfully at that. But then it goes back again. I wonder if the whole point was they're trying to make this conscious because here they're setting up the whole thing of how he deals with alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. which you get a payoff later on. <laughs> This is so funny. <laughs> it's so good, isn't it? Yeah, love it. I mean, they're such str- these <laughs> such kind of like comedy straight men. These guys behind and look at the if you look at the hair of uh, RK Maroon when he walks out in a second. And <laughs> it's just all like hair. It's all <laughs> sticking up in it. I mean, back then it's like a hundred bucks. It's like it must be quite, must be worth a lot because he he owes his girlfriend, you know, mm. uh, to money. The camera and stuff, yeah. yeah. See, it's here, the moment here where Rogers just yeah. like yeah, that's it's completely too... like dropped down in frame rate. It's, it's odd, but I think he's trying. They're trying to get into the whole him mm. being sort of burned out. Mm. And then suddenly, because he throws, you know, he throws a wobbly at uh, Bob Hoskins and jumps through the window, um, yeah. which I think is great because obviously they've just cut it out and just pulled it from the out from the outside to create that outline. Yeah, it's so good. Is it, is it, is it, when I, the first time I, when I saw this, because we had seen, obviously, Mary Poppins, you know, Songs of mm. the South, which has been banned for a long time because due to it sort of being, you know, culturally insensitive. Um, yeah, loads of but films. It's, but it's the first time you Pete's kind of... Peaks Dragon. Peaks Dragon, yeah. But they never really interacted well enough for it to actually be believable because this had the shadows added yeah it the felt, lighting yeah the lighting the dynamic camera work yeah well it was that um, it's that era too where you had the spielbergs and you had uh, amblin and you had and mm. scorsese as well where people are just like throwing cameras around and doing all this mm. amazing stuff that actually comes from an economical base because it's oh yeah yeah the idea is that you save t- you're saving time on setups and stuff by getting so much kind of foot coverage uh without you know just shooting conventionally and um and anyway they they took it in a loving direction and just made these amazing sort of visual storytelling camera moves and stuff and and to have animation with that is something else this is one of the best scenes in the film this is amazing this is so 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 it's just so Silvestri's good. score yeah. is just um, which is a lot like goldsmith's um, chinatown mm, yes with the the horns at the front but here you know when he's looking at I mean, it's quite of a stretch to have him sort of developing his own photos but it works so well like narratively there's no dialogue we're just learning about him and you see here you see about his goofy past and the affection here i mean look at if you look at hoskin's eyes he's tearing up yeah here. yeah and he, when he gets to his brother i mean it's heartbreaking you know. the music and the way it corresponds with his brother yeah it's absolutely yeah sylvester had a difficult job didn't he because he's trying to you've got this jazzy element film noir style then you've got to com- combine this element with two cartoons mickey style, mousing style mickey yeah. mousing music but also he because throws in yeah but he also he throws in his kind of action cues like yeah. you've heard in predator and back to the future when he sort of chases off just grab it after mm-hmm. that the film producer's shot yeah um but yeah the jazz stuff i think is is, is phenomenal and here when you've got the other side you see touched it has he his, no. yeah not, his brother's stuff all left there and you can see what jokers they are and how this is, this is wonderful this bit is that <laughs> uh goofy yeah but they were like huey dewey and louie <laughs> <It's> goofy <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I love the shot of them when they're together here at graduation or whatever it is, yeah. where they, you know, the jokers. It's beautiful. And then the shot of them with their dad, who was a clown. Yeah. It was he was like he's a, a born, he's born to a clown family. <laughs> it's like Ali G, the guy who plays him. 1906. It's beautiful. And there they are setting it up. It's, I mean, it's heartbreak. It's beautiful. And then it transits, because it's a Mecca's film. He's a master magician. Mm-hmm. We transition to Don't daylight. Worry. Yeah. And. Yeah, this is so good. And the way it's punctuated too, like the dead silence and then they throw in the bottle. It's, oh, it's so good. <laughs> Just the rhythm of it is perfect. It's... And this, the actor, I forget his name. He was, uh, I believe he was married to Sarah Douglas. Really? Yeah. Uh, and he played the uh, newscaster in... Oh, Superman too, didn't he? Uh, and also he's in Star Wars, the guy that gets his... Oh, it gets his note. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's right. He gets choked out by Vader. Yeah. That's right. And here. So this is is London, isn't it? Yeah. So if you. So this here, this Acme. 
building here. Most of the exterior stuff they filmed in LA, but all of this stuff, all of the stuff that you see with the Acme building, it's, it's a place in London called Shepherd's Bush. And they have a gigantic Westfield shopping mall there. If you go there now, so if you go to West, uh, Shepherd's Bush Station and you go into the Westfield and you go to where the Disney store is, if you go out the back, there's a bus depot, double bus depot. And both of these buildings are still standing, with, but with this Westfield wrapped around it. So where they're standing now, can yeah. you see with the palm tree behind them there, mm. that's all the Westfield now. Oh, right. And inside it, I believe this is the one, if you come out of Westfield, the one on the left... I believe, is this one that they're walking through because it's got this cabin at the back where Jessica's standing. That's right. But there's sort of parallel to it, there's one where buses just go, you know, just park bus- in yeah, yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So this, that- is, this, is, this is closed, isn't it, for storage, isn't it, you said? I think so, yeah. It might mm. have a generator in it or something. But, um, yeah, you can go in and the tiles are exactly the same on the bus, on the adjacent bus depot. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. So mm. it's crazy. And obviously, because they're, they're fully listed buildings. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, they are. There's been a lot of talk about whether they should go or whatnot. Yeah. Um, I love it. There's loads of like these. I mean, this would, be, this would be so much fun if you were making this as an animated visual effects person or director working on this film, writer, because it's all these kind of like tropes of classic Hollywood cartoons. Mm. Stuff like, I mean, we've seen things like the, um, the trapdoor thing that had, you know, the hammer. We've seen these all kind of and things. And obviously Acme as well. Acme, which, yeah. Is, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sim- the name for sort of explosives in Absolutely. like um, Roadrunner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to have, to have the character of Marvin Acme kind of link all that together too. Very clever. Very clever. I mean, it also, it's not, for, for a movie at the time where they had the opportunity to make use of all these characters, they really don't push it in your face they're only used when necessary it's not just like hey we've got Bugs Bunny we've got Mickey Mouse look 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 there's none of that no um, I think now I think this opportunity would, if it happened now it, it probably would be pushed a bit more um, so this is this does hold, have some restraint yeah it's so morbid as well, too, isn't it? Just having the dead body in the middle oh, of yeah, that, yeah, too. Yeah. As, a, as, a, as a kid, there's two moments in this film so that kind of do... Um, that did kind of scare me as a kid was... Um, obviously, we see the shoe get dipped in in the dip, as yeah, it's yeah, called. Yeah. And, and obviously, the um, when Christopher Lloyd's character gets crushed by the steamroller, it yeah. freaked me out. And here he is. What, a, what an introduction. I love that music cue that he has by Alan Sylvester. It's so great with the bell, you know. Yeah. That almost sounds like it's sort of in the same acoustics as the room that they're in. So (laughs) echoey. But the great thing about his character is, you. I mean, I knew even as a kid, like straight away, it's it's signposted. He is the villain. Yeah. He's got his fake teeth and he looks like clay makeup all over him he's kind of skeletal he's evil yes, he's all oh, in black yeah um vampiric almost but he's kind of like also um he reminds me of i forget the character is in raid of the lost ark oh the german one he comes in the um, guy's face melts yes you know, yes yes it's kind of of that so you know what it is but you don't know why he's the villain mm. and they set up the whole tune thing and because he is always looking so disdainfully yeah at, 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 um at eddie and also because he's Always in control as well. He like his physical movement too. It's mm. all kind of like very rigid. Yes, and it's like he's taken all humanity out of it. He's the most, and he's very sober too. Like mm. when you've got you know Eddie with his his alcohol problem, and and then you've got you've got the judge right kind of next to him, and but he's kind of he looking at him, he's patronizing him. Car- yeah, and he has he has tunes though. Do his dirty work. Yeah, there is this kind of weird connection he has with them where the audience don't know that. You know, he's actually a tune himself. Um, but, you know, he's, he, his character is a judge who somehow come into power where the police are kind of like, they don't sub, they don't really support this guy, Christopher Lloyd's character. And they kind of, just, obviously, he's just in charge, so they have to do his bidding. And they allow instant capital punishment as well. They did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get um, the death sentence. This so, is, this bit always kind of like freaked me out as a kid, yeah. But just the way no, but everyone kind of looks at it awkward, and and they're also look, kind of looking at the the, the, the cartoon characters who've mm. got that you know the slur, the tune, mm. the tune. It's very disdainful the way they yeah. say it. I mean, it's not subtle. <laughs> no, no. But um, they're kind of nobody kind of thinks, oh, that's some uh, uh, beings getting killed. They're just kind of uh. no, as well, you yeah. say, second rate, completely second yeah. rate. 
And this is such a clever idea too, the dip too, because this uh, turpentine and benzene, the way that they say it, it sounds like it's something that they've come up with, but it's yeah. actually in animation, mm. animation cells. This is the way that they clean them. They mm. get that chemical and then they wipe the animation cells to get rid of m- any ink yeah, off the top of them. It's quite a graphic scene. Yeah, one, yeah. I think one of the writers says in the commentary that because they made it an inanimate object with a personality rather than having a squirrel or something. It makes it upsetting as well, a little bit. Well, not as, not as upsetting, it. yeah, because it's yeah. not a, yeah, a squirrel or whatever. You know when he just turned there and you heard the weasel going, hee Yeah. And, but you've got the smoke going up over the top it's of it. It's also the sound he makes with the glove. Yeah. That's really sort of good, sort of, you know, they highlight that detail. And you mentioned before about the whole thing of him being kind of like with the wind and him being air inside. Yeah, when he walks in, every time he walks into a scene, he's introduced, or, you know, um, he, you know, visits Eddie. There's always this kind of wind that comes with his character, like his cape's blowing. Which is kind of a film noir thing. There's actually an interesting little joke they put in the Spideyverse film where the the noir spider has his cape flapping all the time and he makes a note of it. Um, but it's also because at the end of the film, when he gets crushed and he blows that sort of air into him to sort of <laughs> sort of to um, inflate himself, I always felt that he had no weight, so he kind of just floats in. But he's yeah. walking, but he has no weight, so he, that's why he kind of cape flap. Uh, Flatters and um, flaps in the wind. It's an interesting theory, I thought. Yeah, it's a great intro here to Baby Herman too. Who is it? Who is in the book? And it's probably yes. probably the closest character to the, remains the same. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I think so. Because um, this is, you know, for an adult, for, for well, a film that appeals to kids, where he says he's got, a, he's like a fifty-year-old man's kind of appetite, but he's got like a three-year-old. Mm. Well, actually, funnily binky, enough, you, know. you mentioned that exact line. That line, that's one of only two lines that's actually directly from the book. So that's that ah. bit of dialogue. Yeah, that's the other ex- one's just a rabbit line, isn't it? Yes, I'm drawn that way. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. That's right. So it's. But I mean, this is a great. The whole I, thing with the he loses Stogie and he starts crying. You know, I love it. But, but there was a lot of stuff around that time too, like where they they were subverting cartoons and the, the well, like, idea like uh, Fritz the Cat and um, yeah, well I think like Crumb or something. Well, I, I think certainly in the late eighties you'd had Ralph Busky's uh, Mighty Mouse. Yes, it yeah, just yeah. come out, and then Ren and Stimpy was around the corner. Simpsons mm. as well. Was it the comic, what comic books were had this underground scene that was kind of appealing more to adults and sort of, sort of drawing them to be um, like. Appeal to kids. You had oh, there's obviously subverting the, the mm. genre. Well, I guess that's where the book who yeah. censored came from. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's all this subplot now with the um, with with the will. I think it's really clever actually with the invisible ink thing. It kind of they they, yeah. they, they set it up. Yeah, you know, very early on, Again, and you forget yeah. about it, and they make you forget about it. Yeah, the very end, you think shit. Oh but yes, they do things like this in the book, but it doesn't quite. I don't know. It to d- me, it doesn't didn't quite, quite play out very well. Yeah, did they? Is it? Frank Marshall has said they, because he's drinking whiskey all the time, uh, it said Wild Turkey there. I'm not sure if it was them who had paid to have their name featured, but they said, because obviously Roger has some of it and he goes bonkers. They right. go, do you want this kind of reaction to drinking your alcohol? And they go, oh, we don't care. It's like $100,000 <laughs> to, to yeah. have their name in it, you know. If you notice a lot of the stuff with the way Zemecca shoots things, he'll try, instead of, I mean, there's a very sort of, when you're a student or a young filmmaker, you think in terms of shots, so you're like, we need a, we need a wide shot, then we need a close-up. Mm. Then, then we need to, and he just kind of like marries loads of shots together yeah. in one. And, and a lot of, you know, it's either that or people will do a Goodfellas thing where they kind of like have, you know, a camera moving around continuously, whereas mm. he will have... He will have like four shots all in one and then another four shots all in one and then be two or whatever. The rhythm is perfect so it all mm. feels like one. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, like, it's like really good stage directing, isn't it? Yeah, sort of the, you know. it's amazing because you have to think about the timing as well. And in mm. this, you've got the extra layer of having the animated characters and their dialogue, you know, yeah. as well. Which is obviously being read off screen by um, the voice of a drabbit, which yeah, is yeah. Richard... Oh, it was Charles Fleischer. Charles Fleischer, yes, right. He was actually, you know, he's popped up in tons of things. Actually, yeah. one of these kind of kind of small roles, actually, kind of um, obviously quite a menacing role to a certain degree, was in Zodiac, where he designed the posters, and um, Jake Gyllenhaal goes in and he kind of says, "Oh no, I designed these posters," and he's like, "He's got to get out of the house really quickly," and he's like, "Oh my god, it's amazing." Um, this is great. The way that they meet here too. This is kind of, I guess, a twist, a uh, kind of a kind of version of what's in the book because what happens in the book, what's really odd uh, is that they, where, there's kind of like the the two, the cartoon characters in, in, in the book 
they mm. sort of use their mental power to generate sort of stunt versions of themselves for when they're doing like violence and stuff. Um, and anyway, Roger gets killed in the book. Roger actually gets killed, and it's his stunt version that that then Valiant's left with. Yes, you said. I thought it was so bizarre. I, you know, it's clearly why they dropped that because I don't think it was a very good idea um, because it just kind of doesn't really ultimately make sense. No, well, it's a thing that just kind of about works and with a lot mm. of exposition. Mm. Um, the speech bubbles, don't they, in the book? Oh when yeah, talk. when they talk, the speech bubbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And they actually have people with butterfly nets and stuff to catch them at, <laughs> at bars and stuff. That's quite funny. I mean, I, 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 I quite like that. There's some of that stuff, but when they actually meet. He's being killed, and uh, and Ro- and then yeah, Roger turns up, and he still wants Eddie's help because he's already paid him for the case, um, and so they're they're doing kind of a version of that. But mm. this is beautiful just because they're just having him. I mean, this scene here, this is hot. This really is wonderful. Gets you, when Roger it? feels really sorry for sitting in the chair, look, yeah, you know, he's been shouted at, and even as you said, you know, the the spiders webs and dust that are left mm. behind on the chair. It's completely heartbreaking. <laughs> Sober fellow. <laughs> it's like, uh, what I thought was very interesting with this movie, what they did extremely well with making you believe that Roger Rabbit had been around for years. Because um, mm. as a kid, you, 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 thought, you, you saw it, you think, oh, maybe he's been in something in the past, in a Disney or Warner Brothers thing, um, and I just hadn't seen it. Um, so they they integrate him very well to make you believe that he's he's part of this universe, he's part of these cartoons, and you just accept it. Yeah. But it was a new thing. Yeah. Uh, but the weird thing is, after this, this film was probably the, one, probably the biggest hit of 1988, I'd say. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, but after that, we had, we had a, you know, a couple of the toys, you know, as toys and stuff, much like as video games. But in a short while, the appeal of Roger Rabbit kind of just disappeared. People just weren't interested in him. The character, not yeah, the, the character, not the film, the character itself. I mean, they had the three, they had those three spin-off shorts that were yes. kind of made in the style of the one at the beginning of this film. Um, you had Tummy Trouble, Roller Coaster Rabbit, and Trail Mix Up. And Trail Mix Up came out in 1993. That was the, That's last, the last one. one yeah. Um, but you know, you're absolutely. I think you're right, and I think the main reason is because in the actual source material in the book, Roger is. I mean, he's a nothing he's a just irritating <laughs> and here well, they, yeah. they've tried to give him humanity but there isn't that much to do with him he is he's a one gag kind of thing he's he's like you know he's there to babysit baby herman that's it mm. once yeah. you've done that joke over and over and over again i think it's more the influence the film is more influential than the character much more. yes definitely definitely and, and there was always talk of them doing a sequel i, I think mm. it was touchstone i think i think it was Armageddon or Pearl Harbor. I don't think maybe Pearl Harbor was touched there. I don't know. But I think the overspent on those movies had crippled them doing any sort of sequel to this. And this, this would have been you know, over a decade later. Mm. Um, It'd be so hard to top this. It'd be like making fierce... You know when they made fierce creatures after they made a fish called Wanda? Yeah, that didn't it work, just, did uh, it? Like you're setting yourself up for so much. Maybe it would be brilliant. Maybe it'd be perfect. Hey, you know, there's loads if of... If did it again, you know. And, um, but then you, you kind of had him... T- you know, going into the animation world again with the Polar Express, Beowulf, and mm. and the Christmas Carol. Beowulf, I think, I think, I think is probably the best out of the bunch. But just thematically, um, in terms of what the film's about, about as well, like they wrap it up so well in this, and and they do, and, and yeah. they give the other thing they just give. I mean, it's I really despise the way people say the book is darker because it's darker in that it's cruder. In my opinion, it's just my opinion. Mm. But I think that there's the the notion that this, because it has heart, is therefore a lighter film. I don't, I don't think so. And I think, I think too. You know, we make mention about the segregation. I think mm. here, I think there, it's sort of, it's it's sort of more kind of cynical, maybe. But here, mm. it makes more of a point, and it gives a kind of arc to stuff. Yes. And it and it and and it's and it it's used. You know, it's it's a meaningful film, and mm. and um, I yeah I I I'm not one of these. Hey, it's dark, it's great kind of thing. Because I think that's sort of misleading. It's sort of missing mm. missing the point. There's so, and there's so much dark humor in this film. I mean, you have got weasels with guns and stuff <laughs> casually <laughs> laughing, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and here they set up the whole thing later about you should not laugh because laughter could lead to your death. Yes, that's as a right. tune, sort of w- another weird rule that they made up that you buy and yeah. it's set up and you accept it because they're designed to make you laugh. The, the, the tunes yeah. are they're not designed then then they're, they're not supposed to laugh well just know. in terms of their integration into human society yeah. all they are allowed to do is go to places to entertain they're there mm. to just entertain humans yeah and they're very very seen as these second as you said second rate you know second class citizens yes that's um oh i love this so good it's just it's just the crazy sort of 
you know, interaction with Roger Rabbit. And then when the weasels came up and he put his hand, the water flicked it at him. Mm. It's just trying to figure that all out and do it in a way where you don't see any wires, you don't see anyone sort mm. of activating something to sort of push something, you know. It's Cause now you so could, well done. Now you could roto everything. Nowadays, oh, you really could, yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd have all the rigs in shot and then you'd shoot clean, clean plates and yeah. then you'd just, you know, clean it out. Whereas then they're trying to make all that stuff invisible and then just simply overlay on <laughs> the yeah. cartoon characters. But they're, but they're not even that simple to do because you've got to roto all the stuff where can't I mean, Ken Ralston did an incredible job of sort of yeah. you know, the optical work. You know, making this all work. Because Ken Ken Ralston, I mean, it's like like Dennis Muir and all these and John Dykstra, sort of big names of ILM. And John Dykstra left quite early in ILM's life you know, lifespan. But, but if the, that um, kind of Ken Ralston could come from like Star Trek Two and things like that. You know, he he knew his stuff. They'd all won so many Oscars too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was with Ralston on Ghostbusters Two or the Abyss. Uh, well, they both maybe. No, he was. He did. I think he did Cos Coon, but he basically was. Zeme- he became kind of Zemeckis' guy. Guy, didn't he? yeah. Death becomes a Forrest Gump. That's right. Yeah. Well, he's. I think Brad, my our friend uh, Brad Watson, his favourite FX guy is Ken Ralston. Right. Mine was always Dennis Murin. <laughs> this is. I mean, this set here. It's hidden away with the peephole and everything. It's so clever. It's so funny. It's just, you know, his eye just goes, whoop, and knocks over the glass. It's very clever. This is a brilliant gag. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant gag because you think, oh, okay, you know, he's got to try and cut through the uh, uh, the handcuffs. He just slides through it. Yeah. Just goes, trying to hold the box steady. <laughs> it's great. But the way he sets up the kind of get another trope thing where he's they're making fun of these kind of cartoon tropes like yeah. uh, you know you, you, I couldn't do it any time only when it's funny yeah yeah there's a lot of this there's a lot of self awareness towards the mechanics of storytelling in cartoons yeah which is again kind of the fun of it, it it's, it's it's like saying you know with, with, with Joe Dante had shown so much love and appreciation for fifties B movies and then you see you see that yeah. wonderfully in his movies right. With, with this, it's kind of, you know, Spielberg and Zemeckis kind of showing their knowledge and, you know, their appreciation for animation of the past and, and not sort of forgetting about yeah how things were done and what works and what makes a gag work. And this was their love letter to that time of yeah, when they were growing homage. up. I mean, it's, we talk, we have so many conversations about how people perceive the 80s now. Mm. And um, it's, again, this is a big blockbuster from the 80s. When is it set? 90s. 40s yeah. yeah so it's a lot of looking and they're looking back to their nostalgia and their golden yeah. period and there are 80s artifacts that come out of it just by you know but it's not it's not set that it's it's always and it's always going to be that way like in 40 yeah. years time they're going to be making a film set now yeah yeah yeah, just, yeah. it's how it's it's just how it's always going well, to be well the 90s will then will soon become that sort of period yeah. where people look upon it was sort of like oh my god the 90s are amazing and then we kind of grew up in it going oh that's all right but in, the, <laughs> in the 90s it was all about dazed and confused and stuff in the yeah. set, 60s and 70s yeah yeah, yeah. oasis the beetle yeah <laughs> it's, it's weird isn't it yeah, yeah. it's always a like 30 thing. 30 years behind yeah isn't it? it's you very know. rare that you're kind of in the moment you know yeah um but yeah, the, I was going to say the production designer on this film was uh, Elliot. Animation there's a bit strange, sorry. Yeah, that looks yeah, a bit sh- low frame rate. It, it, Elliot Scott, who designed for Spielberg um, Temple of Doom, and he went, went to do Last Crusade, but he was also done Labyrinth, and he was a great kind of... Uh, Conceptual old art. school yeah. British production designer mm. who did, he did Dragon Slayer as well, but he, but before that he'd done things like um, The Haunting oh, in wow. the sixties, you know, and Tom Thumb, oh, right. um, you know, really going back. And he was actually he was hired when they did Star Wars, the original one. Mm. He was hired um, to kind of help them sort of budget things out and whatever. So um, yeah, like he, he this is an Amblin production, Roger Rabbit, which mm. is you know, Spielberg's company. So he had a bit of a relationship with Spielberg. He also d- apparently designed or started the production of you know the Peter Pan that was going to be made in the mid eighties. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Elliot Scott was he was well, that's, that was still had John Williams attached, didn't it? I think he was, I think he so. dubbed a lot of the songs. Leslie Bricker, like I think. Yeah, perhaps. I think I think they should have really shaved Bob Hoskins doing this, shouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would if I had if I had a hairy back like that and shoulders, I would make sure if I'm going on film I would shave myself I don't know I see I love it I love that because well, that's his manliness <laughs> in, in in the book when I was reading the book it's funny actually because when I read the book I thought the, Eddie Valiant is a uh, Harrison Ford type character mm. and um, and he's not he, uh, uh, you well, know, in sorry this... that animated thing sorry, we mentioned earlier from the 80s that had Paul Rubens 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the voice of Roger Rabbit. But I, I imagined him as as Paul Rubens when I was mm. reading it too. Um, and I like that they go against type. I was going to, and that ties into this here, which we spoke about before. I, as a kid, when I watched this, because you see so many films that are very formulaic, and as a kid, you don't realize sort of the storytelling and, you know, how things work and act structures work and stuff. But I always. When I saw this bit when um, Dolores comes in and finds and, and misreads the kind of cheating, I guess, or flirting yes. with Jessica Rabbit, and then she storms out. I'd seen so many films as a kid like this and TV shows and whatever, where from this point onwards, the girlfriend would disappear from the film and she'd turn up at the end of the third act or whatever mm. um, because of the misunderstanding and, and, and then they get back together. And, and, I, and, and, it, it was, and as a kid, it's kind of, you think of it as boring and emotional, like, oh, mm. really? We're going to have, oh. <laughs> so the character's going to be down now and oh, kind of thing. And refreshingly, she walks straight outside, they turn around and they just have a mature kind of bust up talk. Yes. Uh, and she's so much stronger for it. She's a very mm. strong character and they, they believe in each other and they trust in each other they're looking at each other she's lending money in the past yeah as yeah. well there's debts there and, and it's, de- no, it's she's, so real she's dedicated to and as you well, said there's yeah. there, there's the obvious height distance but it goes mm. against the kind of cliche cookie cutter storytelling mm. that you would expect from a Hollywood film mm. and um, I think it really it really helps it so much well, it, it, she doesn't she doesn't become a generic supporting character she and she's she, never a damsel in distress no either. She's not. She's she's integral to the story. Yeah, um, and they make fun of the damsel in distress thing at the end. Oh, they do. They, yeah. But they re- but they really really make fun of it. That's is a brilliant movie. That this stuff here is wonderful. With the camera moves and then he's spinning around, you know, dancing away, and the lighting works. You yeah. know, with him and he, obviously they've got like a mechanical device here that's kind of they've comped over Roger to smash the plates. It's got suction on it. Yeah, to pick suction up the plates. Yeah. No pain. No, it's stunning. <laughs> I th- I think that's th- that's Hungarian Rhapsody, but I think that um, a lot of this stuff and also the music that's played at the beginning, the merry-go-round stuff um, at the beginning mm. when they're in the in in the, in the club as well. I think a lot of that stuff is Silvestri doing stuff on his Synclavier keyboard. Oh, yeah, that's something he used on Flight Navigator. Yeah, sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. That was his toy of the time. Well, yeah. it was the first kind of digital, I guess, what, sampling thing, wasn't it? Yeah, I think Steve Copeland, did you, Stuart Copeland used that. Was yeah, his, everyone was yeah, using yeah, it, and they cost they, they Howard cost Jones as, well. as the house. <laughs> oh, did yeah, like sixty k or something stupid, crazy amounts of money. Look all the little set decoration bits as well too. It's just brilliant. We're watching the Blu-ray, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So apparently, my friend told me there's a four K version on Disney Plus, but I probably imagine that's just an upscale. Mm-hmm. And it's setting up here too the idea of um, laughter being a, a weapon that we have. Mm. So of course it kills the weasels later, but it also defines who tunes are as well. I mean that's uh, again they're there to you see there his coat his coat yeah his coat starts flapping in the wind and the framing there too is a shot the mm. red behind him yeah and the red light that had gone on before it's all danger danger it's so beautiful mm. visual storytelling well it's doing exactly what cartoons do isn't it it's Mickey Mousing isn't it. With the, with the score. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the bad guy. It's the bad guy. <laughs> kind of. Well, Mickey Mousing is this idea of literally... You're copying. Putting, what, yeah, yeah, so, you know, if somebody's running on thin air, then you go... Dee, 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 that yeah. kind of thing. And they're acknowledging that, but they're also doing... Uh, Sylvester is doing so much more. So, as you said yeah. before, he's mm. doing dramatic stuff. Oh, this goes straight through me, the sound effect. <laughs> it's great. I wonder what... When they do the foley, I wonder what they actually use to create that sound. It's always like the complete opposite to what you think it is, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's probably... <laughs> the sound of I don't know so all that gun sound effect was actually someone being sick into a bin <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing yeah oh just go straight through you <laughs> he's I, and Christopher Lloyd just now Christopher Lloyd now he how he gets Roger to reveal himself is that tapping noise yeah, isn't yeah. it shave and a haircut that's two right. bits yeah, and this, he's like, I'm oh, going mad, you know. <laughs> well, the, the reference to Harvey, the, the, the movie with, um, uh, it was James Stewart, uh, about Invisible Rabbit. Oh, yeah. Again, when I was a kid watching this, I didn't know what Harvey was. <laughs> so he goes, say hello, Harvey. I think my uncle behind me kind of... <laughs> well, there you go. It's, it's loads of gags in here for adults, you know, who who, who would appreciate all these all sort of... Uh, yeah, nods yeah. to the cartoons of the past and movies. You know. I love the awkward laugh. Look at Christopher Lloyd here. The awkward, yeah. trying to pretend to be a human thing. Yes. It's so funny. Look here. 
<laughs> yeah, he's so creepy, wow. isn't he? He's so scary. And you can see in HD that they really are fake teeth. Oh, they? yeah. I never noticed that before. That's so great. And he knows that a, a Roger's been there, or a tune, because of the, of the song. I love the precision, too, of his when he, his movements and everything. Like when he throws this as a frisbee. Mm. <laughs> it's like robotic. Yeah. We watched a film last night, that Lee Wan L directed, called... Um, Upgrade. Upgrade, yeah. And there's a guy in that who's like, his spine gets destroyed, and then he gets a computer chip stuck in the back, and yeah. he ends up sort of becoming very sort of rigid walking. I suppose it's moving a little bit like Robocop in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It? yeah. But it's like this sort of stuff. Yeah, you know? it reminds me of but that. But it also shows you his clumsiness as well, that he's yeah. still a tune. He's, he lets his guard down a couple of times. And it's right. subtleties in the performance to, yeah, you know, to. Uh, but he's, when he does it, you don't kind of bite like it's when he's. No, smi- no, you don't see think. Oh, okay, that is a tune Ooh, is or a human or. Yeah, whatever. yeah. He's hiding something. Yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> I love the rhythm that he talks. I only talks like it. It's just <laughs> yeah. really brilliant. He was the villain in Ducktales, the movie Treasure of the Lost Lamp, as well. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Christopher Lloyd also demonstrates that he can be a good guy and a great villain as oh, yeah, well. Yeah, you, know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, he's just a lovable character in Back to the Future That's who great. you just, you know, uh, adore. And then he's plays, you know, very quickly <laughs> plays a bad guy. You mentioned before about the wind-up here mm. of Roger when you cut to him. <laughs> There's a great... When you do comedy, because I've, I've... I Professionally, I've edited a lot of comedy in, in, in my time. And um, a lot of the time when you're doing sketches and stuff, especially if it's anything visual, it, mm. usually it will be, there will be a visual gag, you know, mm. so I don't know, let's say there's an elephant in the room, whatever. Somebody say, there's an elephant in the room, it's a close up. Mm. Uh, the other person say, oh, really? And then it cut to a wide shot and you can actually see the elephant or whatever, you know. <laughs> and Zemeckis, when he's, when he's doing a lot of these gags, like when he was doing the whole thing with Roger, getting pent up because of the shave and the haircut, they he doesn't show it until right at the end. Right at the end, yeah, So you're yeah. kind of like, ah, you know. Because you think, oh, it's not going to work. It's not yeah. going to work. And he, you know, he knows exactly it's always going to work. But it's, it's, and it's a suspense moment, but it's kind of shot like, com- it's really clever. It's really mm. funny. This is a great gag as well, because he's like, you got, he goes, you do want to drink? He goes, I don't. You do. Yeah. You don't. You do. <laughs> I do. It's like, <laughs> yeah, the rhythm of it too. The rhythm of the sequence, the music, everything. Rhythm is everything, really, with editing. I mean, you know this. Yes. I think you've Easier. edited a few videos. I oh, haven't yeah. in your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's all about rhythm and and rhythm and timing. Uh, yeah, 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 and tone and mm. and this just wow. Some, you know, sometimes you know you, you can easy, you can learn it, but it's like it's a lot of trial and errors. Some people just have a natural talent to do it but it comes musical when it's really good and this mm. is just uh, this is like a symphony you know, it's just beautiful oh, yeah. really good but the difficulty of doing all that when you've got nothing to interact with you know yeah. it's, just, it's so much more of a headache i can't imagine editing this with no. with with no animation imagine there's no animation imagine this scene here you yeah. do i don't i do i don't there's nothing there yeah i love the reverse psychology here <laughs> And I love the reaction shots too of Hoskins. He glues it. So he, glues it. he grabs her top. Oh, the cleavage joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fu- Do you know what? It's funny and it's kind of cheeky, but it's not crude. No. It's just kind of innocent. And this is the. <laughs> here we go with the payoff of the. Uh, <laughs> him drinking earlier. Like everything is paid off in the film. There's not one loose strand. Even the fighting here is great. They should have had the gag where the guy's wig flies off, you know. <laughs> there's, we mentioned this before we were watching it, but there's a lot of license taken with, like when Roger falls here, he kind of slows down, he decelerates. Yeah, 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 yeah. They take, throughout the film, that's a cartoon thing, isn't it? They, yeah. they, but they do it with real life physics in here too. Oh, I, you know, you see that Doom looks up when he, yeah. he's just, you just get the feeling that the, 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 the dips kind of lightly hit the soles of his shoes and mm. he's inches away from Gone. being attacked. Yes. Obviously, as you said earlier, with the Roger stops before falling in the dip. Where, you know, they, do, they used to go later on with Bob Hoskins. He goes in the elevator and opens the door and it, or whatever, or the window or something, and he falls to his death, essentially, out of the building. Because he's yeah. <laughs> nothing there, you know. And it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's when you meet Mickey and, Don, uh, and Bugs Bunny. Here we've got... Benny the Cab. Now, Benny in the book, there, is a, he, there isn't a Benny in the book. There isn't a Judge Doom in the book either. There isn't a Dolores in the book. There, there's all different characters. But I think Benny, because Benny, okay, it, 
here we go. The plot, <laughs> the plot of the book, um, is to find out who killed Roger Rabbit, but also to find out who killed one of the brothers of the company that he worked for, the comic strip company. Right. Um, and in doing so, in doing that, what's kind of uncovered is this tea kettle. This kind of mystical tea kettle, mm. um, but it's got Persian. He ends up going to a I think goes to a Persian restaurant, um, and he gets people there to kind of decode what it's about. Um, and anyway, it reveals that there's a genie inside of this that ended up shooting Roger Rabbit, killing Roger Rabbit. Um, but they're trying to track down who's, or Eddie's trying to work out where they got where Roger had acquired this um, tea kettle, and he said he got it from a remake of. Um, Alice in Wonderland, where he'd oh, been right. a bit player or something, and they tracked down the original person who sold it, and it's it's I believe it's a beetle called Benny. Oh, yeah, and I mean beetle is in an insect yeah, called yeah, Benny. Yeah, but then later on, I've read I don't know where somewhere online that 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 originally uh, Benny the cab was going to be Benny the beetle, as in beetle the car. Oh, yeah. So That's I imagine like they've taken the beetle the insect and it's evolved into beetle into yeah. Benny that's where I think it came from and he was animated by the way um, by Dale Bayer's team the Bayer's team in um, Los Angeles mm. because all of the animation most of the animation in this film and one of the reasons they shot in Britain even though Amblin had shot a lot of stuff in Britain at this at this point one of the reasons is because Richard Williams studio he's Canadian but he was based he lived in in Britain yeah and it right. had done so since like the 50s so they had an animation studio there he had an animation studio there they had a lot of international animators brought on it this is a massive international effort this film yeah. too um, and anyway so, but they ended up needed overspill animation done and so the entire two town sequence toontown and all the benny the cab stuff i believe is done by the bayers he doesn't because the the, sp the frame rate doesn't look as good like the frames per second really do you think when you and when you come into toontown really i i always thought it didn't look as fluid Ooh, I, think sure it's, I think it's, i think it's because there's too much going on on screen to sort of Maybe to sort of keep up with that. Maybe, I maybe, maybe, maybe a bit wrong, but I always, I did feel that, that the car did sort of kind of get crowbarred into the film, like just quickly. Oh, he's in. The, they get in this cab, and then yeah. oh, he's behind them. Oh, he's inside. Okay, right. Um, but I suppose that's kind of a structural thing they do in cartoons, anyway. Yeah, oh, it's there. You know. Well, he's been arrested by the uh, the, the mm. weasels for doing something dumb. Anyway, this um, cinema. This interior, this is, I forget where this is. This is in Surrey somewhere. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, or it was at that time. And I believe it's the one that they use in an interview with the Empire at the end as well, too. Oh, that's where Brad Pitt watches Superman. Yeah. How weird, <laughs> you know. Uh, and this this scene here where we get the full-on revelation. This is, this is probably owned by a canon. <laughs> it probably was a canon cinema. Oh, I'm not sure about that. But <laughs> <laughs> the acting here. But, oh, the, it's brilliant, but yeah, also the, the way the camera's just kind of slowly pulling in, yeah, uh, zooming in on in. It's one shot, but you get you really get like a sense of an arc, you know, with with mm. him, and you're going into his soul. He didn't get an Oscar nomination, did he, for this? Uh, did he? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I probably maybe a BAFTA. He deserves. Oh. He deserves one. I mean, he's just. Uh, I, I, if you if you've not seen Mona Lisa. Watch Mona Lisa. That's a really good film as well. And he's really great in it. Long Good Friday. I've got Mona Lisa. I've not seen it yet. Yeah. I mean, just look into his eyes there. And it's such... Such a subtle performance too, to be doing opposite this. And then to cut away to the... <laughs> to the crying rabbit. As a punchline too. I mean, to me, this is dark. This really mm. is dark. That's so good. You know, the costumes are great as well, too. Joanna Johnson designed the costumes on this, and she has worked with Spielberg a lot since, and I think she's done a lot of Zemeckis' films, too. Um, it's, you know, the texture on uh, Eddie Valiant's tie mm. is wonderful. Did they bring over any sort of Roger Rabbit stuff to sort of the Disneyland studio sort of thing, like the, the tours and stuff, or have like a ride? Mm. They did, I'd... yeah. I saw there was one a few years ago. There was a Roger Rabbit thing. I've seen mm. that, yeah. They're little bits and pieces. And there was that TV show called Bonkers as well, wasn't there as well? 
bonkers. Do you remember? It doesn't ring a bell. 1993, and it's set in They'd obviously made fun of Roger Rabbit in Tiny Toons, hadn't they? I yeah, I showed you that a, one. A short clip where he's just like... And they actually animate him at 24 frames a second. <laughs> and he's going, yeah. and all that stuff. Um, but bonkers, check that out too. That's uh, That was a Disney show that, when it came out, because it's set in Toontown, it's, about, it's basically about a... A uh, cartoon animal star who becomes a policeman in L.A. Oh. And there's Toon Towns in it as well. And when you watched it, we all thought, hmm, is this because they couldn't get the rights to Roger Rabbit? But we're, we're sort of reading afterwards. Apparently they didn't. They just wanted to get, you know, get into that, that world. Yeah. Yeah. Because so. um, you don't see much of Toon... Well, you, see, you know, Toon Town. You, you see a... It's there for a, a decent amount of time to sort of show you what it looks like. But you don't really spend a lot of time oh, there. Oh, but, I mean, we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. But, um, and this, in terms of exposition, too, is so good. I mean, this is lovely. It's a lovely little intimate moment between um, Dolores and Eddie. But I, I, it's really clever how the camera holds yeah. to show that, you know, this is a clue. You know, this is going to show you that. I mean, now you, what could, the plan is. you could comp that in. But this is all done live. Oh, yeah. This kind of revelation here, too. But the camera grammar, the way that it became this, it was a wide shot. Mm. And now it's become this, this over the shoulder and then turning around a close up of, um, of Eddie Valiant here. I mean, it's the use of the camera grammar. The grammar, grammar, camera mm. grammar. That's another Zemeckis trait. Mm. Brilliant. Spielberg, Scorsese, they're just geniuses with this stuff. This stuff, I believe, was shot at Elstree. This little yes, insert bit here. That seemed kind of familiar. And the this, this is all the stuff that got destroyed, you know, when the Tesco's was built. Yeah, I think possibly it might be the underground car park at Elstree, actually. Hmm. The breeze blocks, they're not very forties, <laughs> um, but I, no, I never noticed it. It's great, and it, you know the twists and turns here are really good. I think it's, they st- like they've managed it, to keep the mystery element going. And yes, because you think oh, it could be Jessica Rabbit behind yeah. all this. You well, know. they totally shoot this whole sequence. We do to think to think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfectly. And it's the foley as well of her um, high heels. Yeah. It's brilliant. This is a great scene. You know, they got that possum thing on the wall. Pistol possum. Yeah, I want that poster. It looks great. Yeah. I wonder if they actually released any of those posters. It must have been really cool to have some. It's a good collectible. I mean, everything has a meaning in it, in this film. Everything comes back later. I mean, you've got the steam back that comes back in the scene as well. Yes, in the moment, yeah. Which Which is kind of a similar... You've seen the film Hail Caesar. Right. Where Frances McDormand gets her... (laughs) She gets her things... Oh, right. A scarf and a bit stuck in the uh, machine. (laughs) She chokes herself. (laughs) You know, with that pistol possum thing in the background, I'm wondering, do you think think that they... I'm wondering what came first in them thinking about the whole thing of it having the gun reflection. Because if you look at the poster, it looks like mm. it's designed around the gun that that, mm. that that Judge Doom has. It must have been. Yeah, of course it would be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It just looks quite awkward on the poster, but it's brilliant. In the revelation here too, when you... When Arcane Maroon's inter- interrogated and you hear about how much he really, really loves tunes. Yeah. Too. It really gets you. It's really emotional. It it, it play all plays into that he has been double crossed. You know, they've already been forced to, you know, sell his stake in it all so they can build this freeway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you get this. You, it's set up to be something so bad, mm. and then the twist actually is that no, it comes from a good place. Yeah. But just the way that, as you say before, the way it's structured and the way that you're seeing all these cutaways to Jessica and it's sort of misleading you and taking you the wrong way. And Did just, you, could you, we, we sort of had comparisons uh, to Chinatown with the musical score. Did you, mm. Do you feel that there, there's similar elements with its plot? Um, not so, I mean, I guess... Because you mentioned it and I was like, cause I, I'd seen Chinatown recently. I thought, well, I, I didn't watch it and think, oh, okay... I I'm, I feel like I've seen this before. No, 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 no. Okay. I think it's just more sort of incorporating real life or based on real life elements. With that, mm. it was about water, wasn't it? Mm. Whereas here, it's about transit. And I think that yeah. um, those are kind of those are the main points. There are some mm. interesting um, articles and stuff online too, where mm. people have you know dissected things. But I think. Um, I again, I'd like to just know about the development really, and that period in the nineteen eighty three when they kind of they'd moved because they had 
as you said in that video, they'd move it to a more of a 40 setting. Yeah. So, you know, why they would move that and how much mm. of it had changed since and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And as they're driving up here with Toontown, this is um, Griffith Park in uh, Los Angeles, which is used in many films, including it's Back to the Future 2, right? Yeah, when he chases yeah. Biff with the uh, hoverboard. Because I believe the the, the observatory is near here, which was in, used in La La Land as well. It's like very. And also, you said uh, when Michelle Pfeiffer goes back into Gotham, she travels through here. Oh yeah, and it's used in Batman Returns. Yeah, yeah. I love this. This is great. Oh, oh, this is great. This is another great visual. No, <laughs> no dialogue thing. Perfect filmmaking. What well, I mean, oh, so good. And and it wraps up the whole thing about his drinking problem too. Yes, like. I love the, the gun he's got. I love his... Yeah. The little thing about Yosemite Sam. Yeah. One of the voice actors on this, I forget who they are. They're fam- these are famous voice actors. One of them is Jim Cummings, who has done many voices for many Disney afternoon things. He because he's in... They cameo. Two of them cameo in Back to Future 3 in the bar. Okay. Well, the five years. Because he's, yeah. he's also... I recognise him from Robin Hood, Disney okay. c- uh, cartoon. Um, I think he actually plays the sheriff, I think, actually. The music here is just dynamite too it's really uplifting music but just here just one shot he pulls out the he pulls out the bottle and he just push straight in and just everything on his face you get so much information just look at that for screen acting again if you're a director or an actor or whatever just look at bob hoskins watch bob Hos- just amazing great and then they play it off here too with the test of the of the bullet Mm-hmm. And then the door goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it plays on the expectation too with the uh, tomahawk. It's oh, so good. <laughs> and the suspense here. I mean, going in here now, once they're inside, because that's all, oh, you kind of see it light up there. But once mm-hmm. they're inside, uh, once he's driving through, I believe it's a miniature. It becomes a miniature that was shot all at Iron Lamb. I remember as a kid, Oliver, oh, I remember this so well. Just <laughs> seeing this for the first time, the anticipation. What's, you, it gonna, what's it going to look like? What's I, it look like? You know. you know, I'm a kid. I want to see cartoons. I want to see cartoons. And this blew my mind. <laughs> this was the most mind-blowing thing I've ever seen. I, I was just, whoa. And there's so much to take in on left and right, and it's pouring past you, so many details. Uh, like, and you, you can't believe your luck. You're like, well, I'm, I'm stunned. I can't take it in. There's too much stuff. And it's so many different companies. It's Warner Brothers. It's it's MGM. It's it's Disney. There's so much stuff just flying past your face. You've got the Lur- Luck and Dragon there. You've got the pigs. Uh, I mean, it just uh, Jiminy Cricket was there. Jiminy Cricket, and, yeah. yeah. And then the way he becomes distracted by the birds and you actually end up in it's, the it's middle of the opening. with the fields. It's kind of yeah. like a quilted sort of bed sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Some patterns on it. And this here, when when it does the pullback, the, zo- the crash zoom out, which is very against the period, but it's just, I mean, this crash zoom hit, that just blew yeah. my love that, mind. You love that. You <laughs> see Snow White taking the... Wow. Well, you know, is that she... bonkers in the background at the top before the, before the dwarves walk it's in? I thought it was all bonkers then. I <laughs> predated it. And again, this edgy stuff where you're taking things like the little birds and hitting them, physical violence towards them. And I love this. It's like this little doppelganger sort of like... Lena Hyena, <laughs> who's made up for the film. It's weird, isn't it? Because after, obviously, the success of this, a couple of years later, we had Cool World. Yeah, um, which was Which was bomb. Which was That's Richard bomb. Williams, by the way, doing the voice of Droopy. Which, Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, OK. Um, cool World. Yeah, because that was... I remember being quite interested, intrigued to see that. Um, actually, it wasn't a kid's film. That was a 15, I think, that rated movie. Um, Brad Pitt and Kim Basinger. Um, I never got into that. I, just I never got into it, no. It was a crap story. But it had a bit of heart in it, from what I remember. Yeah, there's too. some interesting designs of the world because you spend a lot of time in that world. Um, but in the human world, there's some of his mum at the beginning as well. Yeah, the road accident and stuff. It's, in, it's got some interesting stuff in it, but it is kind of ultimately flawed. Just look at the look at the art direction in this. Look at the layouts. They call backgrounds in this layouts. Mm. Shoe tree. There are so many little bits of uh, deep. What's that? To, to for a good time, call Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> 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 so yeah, here we go. Like, this is a repeat gag of sort of this, like, but yeah, as a kid, freezing in midair. I mean, there's Tweety Bird, which Tweety Pie, which is which is almost kind of enough for you. But like, I was just dazed looking at all the backgrounds, looking at the detail. <laughs> there's like faces on all the buildings as well. And when he meets, and actually, there's hands. Can you see the hands on the on yeah, the, the, the clock. <laughs> And then this blew my mind too, this cameo too. 
because as you say it could be a bit product placement -y. it could be a bit kind of like you know especially if you've got competing studios Disney and Warner Brothers at the same yeah, time they both got to have the same amount of dialogue yeah it's like the Paul Newman and the uh, Steve McQueen <laughs> scenario yeah. and Harry Inferno but for some <laughs> reason for some reason it doesn't feel muggy it doesn't feel like they're doing that it feels kind of Fun. And it's kind of mischievous too how Mickey, who's quite an innocent character, is kind of mm. laughing along with it. Yeah, because he goes, you better give it to him. <laughs> and he like, gives him the tyre. But this, um, um, is this the last time we, we saw Mickey on the big screen? Uh, he was in The Prince and the Pauper, and right. uh, I th which came out a couple of years after. And there, I think there was another one since. Mm. Playing, they take a great amount of creative license with distance in this too. Oh, they do, yeah. As we said sort of before, yeah. <laughs> it's fun, the music. <laughs> but yeah, this, I mean, weren't you like that? Weren't you, when you watched this, didn't you just, your mind just blow inside out? I thought out? it was just mental, yeah. Oh, it says Br'er Bay. If you look at the right there, it says Br'er, oh, be in the previous shot, it said Br'er Bayer. So that's obviously a reference to, to the Bayers. Who supervised the animation? For I this. love this bit. His shadow comes comes to life. Because I'm tight. He's got the big chin. He's got the film noir sort of character in a comic strip. Yeah, playing again more so with. Uh, I think that actually should be a prop there in his hand. Is it? Yeah, it didn't look, didn't look animated. Yeah. You notice the gun falls when the shadow dies. The gun falls into shot as well too. That's right. So much information. Yeah, that is a one shot prop he's got there. It's like it's designed to look like the, the cartoon. Didn't you say it was Ken Ralston running away as um as Doom? As yeah. Doom, yeah. Saying in the shot, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, that's what they. I think yeah. that's what they said in the commentary. Yeah. Where'd he go? <laughs> they're just useless. But there's a lot of perspective too when you look down the streets and stuff. Like you can see people's laundry in the background. Look, right in the back, oh, there's, yeah. there's never like a flat shot. They really went. For, they just really went for it. There's nothing. Everything's all over like over a hill. Everything's all kind of bumpy and all just wacky, yeah. isn't it? You know. But it's just so much depth and perspective to everything. Mm. Here's another instant too, where you've got the uh, the whole cheating, the perspective. Hey, look at the left hand side. Can you see the Cinderella's slipper? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah well, Which that? Scott Allen, Scott Allen Max. Who's that? Oh, maybe they're animators that worked on it. Yeah. It's so good. Such a dynamic shot that. And this music, this um, they used this in the video game as well, didn't they, too? Or the Nintendo one. Yeah. Mm. A terrible game. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, it's, it's also, it's had the same sort of fate, I suppose, with the sort of, the, I uh, mentioned earlier about Roger Abbott's sort of staying power. Another Touchstone movie had a similar problem was Dick Tracy. No, but that's a different, that was, was that it's even a, a success? It was a success, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it didn't it had, a, had this kind of weird summer of Dick Tracy and yeah. it, people got lost interest in him yeah yeah um, this is a great stunt as well isn't it it's really well shot the geography everything you just know where everything is it's here here, here where they, they sort of the old the earlier cuts of the movie where you could see her sort of private parts um, the animators had drawn it in and you could see it on uh, the laser disc where you could pause frame by frame apparently but they later on they'd sort of Brushed that out. Revised it. Yeah. So now the rest of the film... Oh, the car tend to be like, oh, dead. <laughs> He's not dead. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot, isn't there, without saying it. So the rest, basically the rest of the film entirely takes place at Sh in Shepherd's Bush. Next, yeah. Next to Westfield. It's weird, isn't it? It's so weird. It's great. But I think, I like, again, the symbolism of the, you know, the wall, mm. everything... So many great sight gags in this too. We never saw the weasels again in any Disney uh, product, I don't think. No, I don't think we did, no. They like, see there's all eyeballs there. Yeah, which then pop up, you know, they're setting up that for later when he falls over and stuff. Because I think, doesn't it, one, one of his eyeballs falls out? Right. Because he holds his hand up to his face yeah, yeah, and then yeah, he walks yeah. off and he's obviously popped it back well, in. Well, he's slowly kind of falling apart. I mean, yeah. when you think of that and you think of how it's written and you think about how it's staged too, like they're trying to they're, you're, they're trying to undo the character. So you, you're, 
getting a little bit more information as it goes goes mm. on and on about mm. him him falling to pieces about him being a tomb. Yes, but not giving it too much away. Like there's little bits here and there that, on retrospect, you think, oh, of course, you know. And mm. I guess that's what all kind of who done it mystery yeah. pieces are like. Mm. You can see that Cloverleaf, the company, That's owns right. owns the, the it's Hollywood Land. Yeah, I don't, we had a Hollywood sign in the background uh, at one point when he's in. It was the one of Toontown. It, it doesn't say Hollywood Land though, because Hollywood the land had been taken off by that point by forty seven, okay. I think. I can't remember. I can't remember seeing that. Yeah. Do you notice in the background there's a giant uh, somewhere up in the left? Mm. There's this um, giant kind of shadow of a. Like a dinosaur or something. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That was yeah. I I saw it the other day and I thought that was a bit strange. <laughs> so much detail. Look at the, look at the lighting on him. It's great. Yeah. But also things like the car that he's a car driving a car. Yeah. And you just buy it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Just really works. Like to have that. I think this um, exposition sequence here, where he's explaining about the dip. Mm. And about eradicating Toontown. It's like a mountain Jew or something. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> but so that's the only time she actually kind of weirdly looks like a more like a cartoon there when she says "dip." Yeah, she, they exaggerate more of her features, like her face. Um, but but all of this this exposition sequence here is is. I, I just think it's a, like usually I'm, I'm I'm with something like this when you're explaining things you need to kind of like visualize it as much as possible mm. and they do with the dip you're seeing it but so much has kind of been set up before like brilliantly to mm. show like the geography of where Toontown is we know where it is we've just been in that tunnel we've seen it um, and he's delivering a lot of this later in, in kind of a close up. But and it's just you know like a talking head basically. But mm. for some reason the rhythm that he talks, what he's worked, what's been set up before, it's just it really works. Yeah. And look at this shot here where he just walks effortless into a cl into a close up from the background. But he's stumbled and then he's shaking at the end of it. Yeah. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Look at these graceful cameras. You know, it's the barrel that falls down during his dialogue as well. Yeah, and also you see that dinosaur. Yeah. The shadow. It's weird, isn't it? It's beautiful. But it sort of plays into him revealing him being, a, you know, his master plan and everything mm. else. I mean, this is the bit. This here, this music and this exposition, this talking, the way he points, mm. the blocking of the actor, the distance. I mean, even just the way he points there at the wall, too. You get you get a lot of information. And um, Zemeckis, these great filmmakers, they just, they're just they so good at this stuff. They make it just look so... It's like effortless. Yeah. But it's actually extremely difficult to do. And when he says, my God, it's going to be beautiful. Notice the camera it goes into a close-up. Mm. It's one of the few times there might be a zoom on the camera. But it just gives you a bit more. It just it punctuates it a bit more by making it a bit more important. Mm. I mean, this is, this is filmmaking, guys. This is, <laughs> this is masterwork. And the choreography here, too, notice the weasel walks over the top of the, of the manhole thing there. And then, yeah, there and then Roger comes up. But it was on a camera move and stuff, and you never notice it. And Roger is the hero. <laughs> Do you like the score to this? I think it's brilliant. I, my favourite part is the jazz stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he jumps towards <laughs> there like that. You know, it's great. If you notice too, just then he was moving the weasel out of the way, that... You know, I was saying before about all the great stuff with how Christopher Lloyd is is, is shot and, mm. and the visual stuff. Look here, the weasels are over the shoulders. There's like two yeah. over the shoulders at once. Like this is, if this was just humans, this would be complicated camera blocking and cinematography. Yes. But it has animated things in it as well. And it's mm. still like... It, they, they have to be animated to the right scale as well. Like, yeah. you know, how they're positioned within the frame because it don't look too big or too small, you know. Tough, isn't it? Very tough. That's you know we we you know we we we've seen I say we we've cool world where things can go wrong mm. when you do this. Um, Did you ever see Rocker Doodle? Rocker Doodle? No, I didn't see that. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean uh, no, 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 no. The better, it, no, no, no. I mean it's it, you know it's got its fans and and mm. um, and Don Bluth is is a brilliant filmmaker. Mm. Um, but I yeah again it's sort of a. It's a tone thing. As mm. I said before, I think the reason this just works is because you've got that 
the, this dis, these disdainful humans in it, and you've got these uh, these wacky characters too. And the, the contrast, it's the dramatic contrast, and 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 of course this this murder in between it, it's it's just makes it so special. That's oh, that's that's a weird delivery there. It just goes, it's over. I like, like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. It's low key. But, but it's played Subtle. up with something stupid, you know, like yeah. a gag, you know. But it, it shows you his kind of clumsiness. It's and, undone and his, the resenting of it, too. Yeah. It's like now, now his eye's fallen out. Do you know what also brings out this whole sequence, actually, from when everything, mm. from this point onwards, when things start to fall to pieces? Mm. You notice in the background, there's that kind of big, whatever you call it, the fairground kind mm. of, uh, what is it, music box thing yeah yeah that yeah. you kind of have at fairgrounds and uh, i think that really it visually shows wackiness yes yes and it shows eddie moving towards being more comfortable mm. with his wackiness and it's also showing judge doom falling to pieces and revealing himself as a wacky tune yeah as well an yeah. evil one it was, it's always it's a line by mickey mouse later on like he wonders what he looked like we don't actually see Doom's um, original fall. No, um, and this probably is for the best, I suppose. But it's kind of he has weird abilities where he, he's got this kind of blade that comes out, rotating blade that extends. He's got knives that come out his eyes. Yeah, um, it, and he sort of hops around the screen at one point, and it's like, what is this? You know, what is this form? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even when they refer to it at the beginning, and, and like, is he as? And is he the only? evil cartoon mm. it must be he must be because um that's what made it s everyone so like mm. shocked that his brother was killed mm. you know like, it couldn't like, like it couldn't happen you know <laughs> i mean this is another one where it plays with physics where <laughs> and a banana <laughs> yeah well even when he's gone in the minute where he's on the uh Pobo stick and he gets electrocuted. Oh yeah, his and he's face. and he's like forty feet in the air. You can see the wires, and he just collapses forty feet in the air. Yeah, to the ground. But you buy it, like yeah, it yeah. kind of works. He's. <laughs> I do love it when one of them that he dies and he's trying to pull his ghost like that. He's trying yeah, to pull his ghost yeah. back into him. You know, those are subtle things that are kind of really hard to write. And sometimes they don't work. And mm. there's a lot of that stuff in, as I say, in the book with the, you know, I was saying before about the blah, 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 the speech bubbles and stuff that don't yeah. quite work. But here... I, 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 I think Bob did do quite a bit of his own stunts because you see in the behind the scenes where he's done it like a somersault forward into front of the camera. And it's him, you know. Yeah. And the fun play of innuendo there. I didn't get that as a kid. I didn't get the ball stuff when I was a oh, kid. Oh, didn't I? No. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it works great. <laughs> You got the use of red there as well, the danger. Escalating danger. Shown visually. <laughs> Doesn't like load of piss. It's all got like a weird yellow colour. I think it would it would be um but it's a, it's a it's, it's visually shown as green, isn't it? Yeah, but it's also like because you've got it kind of moving horizontally mm. to you know, spraying out towards uh, Jessica and mm. uh, Roger, and it's doing it horizontally left to right, isn't it? Yes, it kind of works as it's basically a stop clock for us as a oh, viewer because yeah, yeah, we know yeah, it's yeah. that point, it dries up the tension. It's really clever. Oh, I spent oh, that so music, yeah, diddle, diddle, diddle. It's, in fact, it's sort of actually reminds of sort of Shirley Walker style, right. It's very Bernard Herrmann esque, mm. isn't it? Yeah. I watched this so much, Oliver. I wore the, <laughs> I wore the VHS out, and you know what? The resolution, because it's all shot in Vista Vision and everything. It never, the resolution never really it never went. looked that bad, did it? It always looked pretty good on, yeah, on tape. I remember my uncle first time in 1991 watching this and kind of, oh, it's Sinatra. <laughs> So you actually got Frank Sinatra. Singing so yeah. you know, <laughs> all things. I like the way they kind of stop to acknowledge it as well, but it's yeah. not, in, not in a way that kind of cheapens the film. I, it would be nice if you actually pulled out the sword and the, so the sword and the stone from the Disney thing. Yeah, you know, although that was from the 60s. Yeah. Although we've just seen Cinderella Slipper, which was from the 50s, so mm. maybe you're right. I mean, there's that argument too, I guess, is even if we don't see, you know, we're seeing stuff that didn't happen... In 1947, like mm. at the end when Porky Pig appears. Oh, yes, is, good point. Yeah. Is that a bad thing? Just because it hadn't been, that's Loki as well. Christopher, mm. Lee, Christopher mm. Lloyd, when he says uh, that's Loki. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, as a, I suppose if you're going to be like a, 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 like a, a tick box of what you'd have, what you'd seen by that point, then maybe. 
You know what I mean? But also imply that Betty Boop was kind of like a has been. Like she yeah. just kind of she's had her time. But like like by forty seven, had she? But I was saying like when you see the Cinderella thing, even though Cinderella hadn't come out at that point, yeah. Cinderella the character was probably yeah. alive. They just hadn't been yeah. in the film yet. They just hadn't been cast. She was yeah. probably an act. You know, an actor who's working in Toontown and she's waiting for her break. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So having the sword in the stone, would it really be that bad? He's great with the physical action as well, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. A sort of slapstick kind of like, yeah. um, like uh, falling over and stuff. I forgot about the, the glue. Yeah, yeah. It's like... <laughs> 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 it's like... <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> you know, the physical effects supervisor of this film who won an Oscar with Richard Williams and Ken Ralston really? was a guy, was a guy yeah. called um, George Gibbs. And he, George Gibbs? And he had, worked, he had done um, Temple of Doom with uh, Spielberg mm. and uh, won an Oscar for that. Wow. And, um, and anyway, he said that straight after he'd done this film, I think he, got, he did A Fish Called Wanda. And oh. in a fish called Wanda, they, uh, I think one of the first things that they mentioned to him was, we need somebody to be convincingly, but non-threateningly, mo- like, ploughed over by a steamroller. Yeah. And, uh, and he's, apparently he was like, well, I've just done that. Yeah. <laughs> Ken's pets. <laughs> <laughs> but here, this stuff, this, uh, that, that, that shot there this is bit, Elstree. That bit freaked me out when I, think, I, I, I think that it shot, crushed. I think that's Elstree, this bit. Mm. But this, uh, this bit. Here, this is stop motion. This is ILM. I mean, Industrial Light Magic did a, just a mind-blowing job on this film. We haven't actually dis- discussed much of their work because we, because to us, it's just like 2D animation. That's where the 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 work is. But there is also a lot of subtle yeah. subtleties. Well, they're having them. to composite in Vista Vision. Yeah. Goodness knows, knows how many co- uh, co- composites mm. of uh, you know the characters into the into the frame without having matte lines and all the rest of it. Plus, there's all that lighting and shadow and everything else that goes on top of it to to make it really three D. These these performances, Oliver. These performances are just so good. <laughs> look at Hoskins. She look. He's always yeah. turned the knives. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah, he's always quite a scary villain, wasn't he? Because it's, it's just the eyes, isn't it? And yeah, um, my girlfriend said, "Oh, his his eyes are so kind of like you know big and like, popping out his head. That's what be kind of quite scary for a child." And I was like, "Well, do you know what else a- it is? It's in the mm. it's the way they've set him up too with the because they've got the glasses on. A lot of the time they do it so he's almost his glasses look almost opaque, so you can't see past them. Yeah. So in your mind, you're just thinking, even though you've heard Valiant." And, and Dolores mentioned about these big eyes that you'll never forget they're awful. Mm. You think that that's going to be somewhere else in the film. You never, you'd never think it would be him because mm. he's so... And he's patronising Eddie about, being, about his drinking problem and everything else. Mm. And um, it, it's so hidden. It's so well hidden. You just, it's the last thing that you expect. Yeah. And all this stuff, the way that it's set up, you don't know yeah you have no idea what he actually looks like and it's like he has these kind of weird abilities that don't I suppose, you know sort of make yeah make a lot of sense and the hammer cartoon, you, know. you know the hammer here like there's that one moment isn't there where it's Early used on. earlier yeah to just kind of show that poli- you think it's just police messing around it's brilliantly mm. you know it's so well set up and as you say you just forget about it and then it's brought back like it's so good yeah, there's none of this in the... Fi- so basically in the book, what happens is at this point, um, what happened... Uh, so that tea kettle I mentioned earlier that they, fi- they find... Yeah. It, it, so... The genie inside it. It's got it. a genie yeah. inside it and the, and the genie... Yeah, it's got a genie inside it. It turns out that it's got a genie inside it. I'm not sure if it's a cartoon genie or what, but um, it's got a pirate's gun and that shoots Roger Rabbit. But then at the end of the film... At the end of the book, sorry, Eddie works has worked out and explains to Roger, and Roger acknowledges this, that um, Roger had killed De Greasy, you know, the the boss. Mm. Um, so Roger's kind of the bad guy. So there's none of this elaborate stuff. This well, because there were two more books. There's one in ninety one and two and one in two thousand and thirteen. Mm. So it's, it's obviously still an audience for Roger Rabbit, and yeah. obviously there's probably fans of the book. I wonder, if, yeah, I wonder what fans of the book probably thought of this because they would have gone, oh, it's completely oh, they'd different. Hate it. They'd say it's too light, it's too Disney, too mm. Spielberg, too schmaltz. You know, all the stuff that it basically, you know, it's this is a rounded amazing movie mm. that does so much and it's moving and it's mm. got stuff in it like it's not just a alternative you know it's not a 
or indie comic thing. Mm. Um, I've always loved this ending. Always loved this ending. And the symbolism of the wall being smashed down to the barriers between the two. And a kind of, kind of, kind of a modern train just taking it out. And this score as well. Oh. I mean, this, this, this is to me. This is a perfect ending. Oh, it's a great ending. You, you, you get to see all these characters yeah. appear one more time, all together, and for the final time, you know, With all the humans and everyone's holding hands. And I mean, even the choice of what they've got behind it. You know, Toon before was mad. It was absolutely crazy and wacky. And now, when you look through it, it's kind of tranquil and yeah. happy to match the tone and the mood of the film where it is at this point. Oh, definitely. It's a haven of you see all these squirrels come in now and and, and flowers holding, dancing and holding hands together, <laughs> and, and it's all pure and nice after all the horrible, corrupt evil of uh, of Judge Doom, the self-hating Toon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's nice, too, that you have the cops drive in, which then invites Benny to come back in, too, yeah, as well. definitely. Kind of what you said before about him being... St- oh, the patchwork that you talked about. Yeah. In the landscape. But, um, yeah, they really like... Uh, it's, so, it's so clever how they, they, they made him sort of a flexible character to be in basically any scene. Mm. If they wanted to, I'm sure they could find a way for him to go into his... In Eddie Valance's office if they wanted to, Benny. Yeah, yeah. And there's revelation sequences here. And the music too that sort of beat it hits all the kind of themes and motives that have been set up before. Oh, this is just pure innocence, isn't it? I c I don't really want to talk at this point. <laughs> <laughs> wanna get wrapped That's interesting up. that he said, Yeah, I wonder what he really was, you know. <laughs> A pussy. It's like <laughs> And also the film had to end, doesn't it, with um Oh, the pig! Oh yeah, yeah. What's his name? Porky. Porky the pig. Sorry, yeah. But, but this, this, this revelation here with the with the ink, which you said again, you know, mm. set, set up very very early on, never referenced again. You think you've forgotten about it, and they link it to the will. I mean, ah, oh, try and hold back the tears here. <laughs> <laughs> It's just absolutely mind blowing. Look at the finale here, and look at the way that Dolores reacts here. Oh, it's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Come on, this is just—I mean, it's just. <laughs> this is perfect. <laughs> and then they have their moment here, where they're about to kiss. Everything's wonderful. And it was, it's clever because earlier you see them getting together in the cinema about to kiss and he breaks it. He does the same thing again. Yeah. And then they call back again to, um, to the kiss. I love it because you think that he's going to lose his temper. Yeah. Yeah. And look at Hoskins. Just look at him. (laughs) (laughs) Completely. That's a complete arc. <laughs> Make sure a carrot cake. <laughs> Another crazy innuendo. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> What's that weird unicorn thing there? What's that yeah. from? I suppose like a bit like Ready Player One, where you're like, "Oh, that's something. That's some something." Yeah, I guess yeah. that would that would that is it, isn't it? That's yeah. that's the modern day equivalent of Roger Rabbit, uh, yeah. Ready Player One, scored by Alan Silvestri. Yeah. And done by Amblin, you know, and Warner Brothers. Because like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, watching that, I was like, oh, that's Robocop. That's, that's Ryu from Street Fighter, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Hmm, I like the sound of that. I love the way that's set up. <laughs> and they say at the end that apparently they put Tinkerbell in because it's a Disney pick and they wanted that to be the last thing on the screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be the last yeah. thing. <laughs> well, all of yeah, the... Masterpiece, you know. That is... Uh, Pretty, I mean, you know, sometimes you've very kindly invited me on here and we've had some uh, unconventional films or films that maybe maybe nostalgically mean so much to us and, mm. and uh, might not be considered a general classic by everyone. But um, mm. this to me is, is an absolute classic. I think it's one of the best films ever made. I really do. Oh, I, Schmidt. I, 
Arthur Schmidt. He he did a lot of he did pretty much all of Zemeckis' films up yeah. until um, uh, what's the airplane one with Denzel Washington? I forget the name of it. Oh yeah, I forgot that one as well. <laughs> but he came back to do a bit a bit on that. And this mm. music, can we talk about the music? Sure. We never we didn't really talk about music. So another thing that's really cool about this film is. Um, the music is in this kind of, you know, you've said it's hybrid thing, but it's very, it's it's a very Hollywood sound. Yeah, yeah, of but course, they yeah. they recorded the music in London. They recorded it actually um, at CTS Studios, which is in which was in Wembley. It's now gone mm. now. If you go to to Wembley to watch a, a, a cup game or anything, as you come from the train station directly um, to the stadium, just on the right. As before you enter, if you look down, that's where CTS was. That got right. bulldozed down. They, um, James Horner recorded like aliens there, didn't uh, he? No, 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 no. That's Abbey Road. That's Abbey Road, but, was but, it? But like John Barry recorded a lot of the Bond films at mm. this time there. Um, the first two Superman films were recorded. Uh, no, two and th- three were recorded. And Ken there. Thorne used it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. That, that was there. Um, and, and, it, and just loads of uh, films were there. Queen recorded a lot of their original demos there too when it opened as, de, de, as uh, I think it was Deline, Do Deline Lane. Like uh, John Richards probably doing the mixing Yes, yes, this. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those people. Mm. Um, and anyway, um, they recorded the score there and it's got this very dry acoustic sound to it. Mm. And um, But f- from what I've read and what I've heard, heard in the commentary and, and, and whatever, um, apparently the English players, I forget which if it was the London Symphony Orchestra of the Symphonia of London or whoever it was, but they mm. couldn't quite, apparently couldn't quite keep up with this kind of Hollywood classic uh, golden age uh, cartoon music. It was, and apparently Zemeckis says at one point that uh, apparently it was almost like you could see smoke coming out. <laughs> so, try to go through. so they brought over from the States people who'd worked with um, Sylvester before. And one of them is a guy called Jerry Hay. And Jerry Hay, I believe he played the, uh, he arranged the horns and, and did the, the Formed some of them in uh, Back to the Future. Oh, uh, right. Back to the Future theme. But he also worked with Quincy Jones and did like um, the uh, Michael Jackson album. So like Off the Wall, Thriller, um, Bad. Whenever mm. you hear that, whenever you hear that horn sound that sounds like Michael Jackson, mm. that's 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 Jerry Hayes stuff. Yeah, oh, he's, wow. he's a he's a just uh, you know he's a master. He sort of defined the sound. Hey, he he did the horns on the Ducktales theme. Oh wow! Which okay. came out a year before. Can you imagine that? Hey, I've just finished Ducktales. I'm gonna. Well, actually, it wouldn't have been it'd be a year in between. But you know, he's done that, and then he goes out and does um, goes to England and does this stuff. But just to give it the Hollywood sound. There are other people too. I think Tom Scott as well, who's another jazz guy. He he he's on this too and um so it kind of you know it, it kind of give it a bit of authenticity too but mm. it also gives it that sylvestri sound you know that's so uh you know that's so sort of characteristic well so, 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 so yeah so yeah characteristic and defined by his work during that period isn't it you know you can always kind of hear those cues you hear it in like captain america and the avengers those that, that sylvestri sound where he kind of you know uh, reuses some of those kind of similar cue moments um, and this has it doing those action beats as well. And it, but it's just the, the the piece, the best piece of music is the jazz stuff. It's always Eddie Valentine's theme, and he mem- remembers his brother. Um, it makes it a standout piece. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's, it feels like part of that Hollywood sound. Yeah. Um, and then it also kind of it plays on, especially in Toontown. It it really does a great job of keeping up with homaging the cartoons of that you know of the of the golden era yeah of cinema no absolutely yeah. yeah it's such a you know great technical achievement for the 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 last really that sort of 89 i suppose 1990s sort of the last of these sort of analog optical effects where things were beginning to slowly sort of fall into digital mm. compositing and and pushing the limits of the use of film. Yeah, you know, um, you know the third the third short that they did after this, the trail mix up one, mm. Roger Rabbit. Um, from what I remember, th- like this is all this is all as you say, totally analog. It's all cell animation and optical printers and stuff. Mm. Whereas that one, I believe they used the cap system, which I forget. I can't remember exactly what it stands for. Oh, the cap system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember aided, that. You know, but it was the, it's the idea of like um, you draw into the you know the, you scan into the computer and then yeah. the colours are done in the computer. I think maybe the I think maybe the shadow had used some of that. 
I think Illusion Phantom, Arts were pushing it. The no, the Phantom. You used I remember. I remember sending you something on it. Yeah. Once. Um, I, mean, I have mentioned it before in a review. Yeah, yeah, but the whole point was that at that sort of from nineteen, I think from Rescuers down under onwards, they were no longer kind of like you know manually putting in the colours. The, if, if if I've got this right, look it up, caps. Um, and anyway, you can kind of see that I think in um, in in Trail Mix Up, mm. um, although it's still beautiful. I mean, that's still a knockout thing. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we're right at the end now. Produced at Canon Elstree Studios. Yeah, that's Canon Canon's still owned it. Yeah, they say I think it was, was it eighty nine or ninety one they'd sold it. Oh, eighty eight. Eighty eight was this. So this would have been yeah. Well, Last Crusade had shot something there. Yeah. Oh no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, this filmed from uh, when was it? 86. November eighty six to April. Yeah. Uh, eighty seven. Well, everyone, that is the end of the commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, me and Tim will be back with some more in the coming weeks. Okay, everyone, take care and goodbye. Bye.